Hello, and thank you for joining me again today on the Finding Hope After Loss podcast. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Please leave a review or a rating if you like the show. The reviews really help the show reach more people. Are you the type to make New Year's resolutions or goals? This is something that I've always done as a family every year when we were growing up, um, and it's something I try to continue to do now. And I think a big goal for all lost moms can be just to be gentle with ourselves. Allow ourselves the space we need to grieve in the way that we need to grieve. Stop blaming ourselves because I promise it is not your fault. To stop being so hard on ourselves in general. To not hate our bodies for failing us. I know it's a bit of a tall order. It isn't something that comes overnight. And sometimes it even takes months, sometimes even years, to reach a point of acceptance. But taking steps towards this goal will only help you in the long run. So for the new year, I'm encouraging you to look at things you can do to be kinder to yourself after going through the heartbreak of infertility or loss. Today, I am talking with Sarah. She had a miscarriage with her first pregnancy and is also the mother of her living rainbow baby. Sarah let her faith help her through the pain of loss and the difficult times of trying to get pregnant after loss, along with her pregnancy after loss. Hello, everyone. Today, I am here with Sarah. Sarah, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, I'm Sarah. (laughs) Um, I am married to Colton and uh, mommy to Peanut in heaven and Josiah here. Um, We live in the mountains in North Carolina. Um, Yeah, and we're Yes, I'm not sure what else to tell about myself, but there you go. <laughs> is there anything you like to do for fun? Um, yeah, my husband and I really love to hike. We haven't done a lot of that since Josiah was born, um, but we're hoping to get back into that soon. Um, so we like hiking. Um, I enjoy writing and like, yes, writing <laughs> and um, that kind of thing. And I, I like crafty things, doing things with my hands and yeah. I bet there's a lot of nice places in North Carolina to go, like see, like yeah. nature wise. Yeah, our county is known as the land of the waterfalls. So wow. there's, a, there's a lot to see here. And I don't know if you, you could probably spend a whole lifetime and not explore everything here. <laughs> That's so cool, though. I didn't realize that there were so many waterfalls in North Carolina. I've never yeah. actually been there. So we're in Georgia now, so not not too okay. far. But yeah. yeah, I'll have to make it up there at some time just to, just to see everything. <laughs> well, we're in... Western North Carolina. So when most people think of North Carolina, they think of like the Triangle area, um, Raleigh and Charlotte and stuff. Um, And we're south of Asheville, like pretty far west up in the mountains. So it's a little different than most people's view of North Carolina. (laughs) I guess most people probably think of the beaches and stuff too. Yeah. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about your last story? Sure. Um, So my husband and I we got engaged in the fall of 2018. Um, and at that time, my mom was like, Hey, we need to go get like your well woman checkups and all of those things before you get married. Let's make sure everything looks good. And I'd been having like some migraines and some hair loss and like all kinds of weird symptoms, um, that pointed to some kind of, um, autoimmune disorder, but we didn't know what it was. Still don't know what it is. (laughs) Um, so went and got, um, checkups and asked for thyroid labs to be drawn and everything looked normal on paper, but I was still having these weird symptoms and my, that doctor, um, has Hashimoto's. So she even was like, let's just check you for Hashimoto's because you have similar symptoms to that. And those tests came back normal, um, But she said, based on your symptoms, I wouldn't be surprised if you have a hard time getting pregnant. And even if you do, then you're probably at higher risk for loss. And um, my husband and I were just, well, we were we were engaged at the time, but I went home and told him and (laughs) we both were just kind of like, okay, well, we'll see what the Lord does. Um, This is not, not any guarantees, but no one in our family had ever lost babies before. And so it was just kind of like, oh, that's a, a warning, but it's probably eh, nothing, you know, 
I mean, we'll have to worry about it. No one had even dealt with infertility or loss or anything really like that. Um, so fast forward um, about two years and a year and a half. And we were like, okay, it's time to start a family and let's start trying. And keeping in mind this morning of it might take us a while to conceive, um, we started trying and we were kind of shocked when we got pregnant within two cycles of trying. And we were like, okay, well, the Lord fixed that. We don't have to worry about that anymore. And here we are pregnant. Yay, let's go. <laughs> and even when I showed my husband the pregnancy test, he was like, what does that mean? And I said, it means we're going to have a baby. And we we're so naive. <laughs> um, and there were, there was really no reason to be concerned. There was no red flags, not even really any yellow flags. Um, we found out we were pregnant the Sunday after Thanksgiving in 2020. And then um, three days before Christmas, I had some spotting, but I'm a birth doula. And I know that spotting is normal at the beginning of pregnancy as your uterus grows and, you know, the different things like that. I had told dozens of clients before, oh, that's normal. Um, nothing to worry about. And then I told all of them, but if you're still concerned, go ahead and just get checked out and it can't ever hurt. So I took my own advice and I told my husband, I'm concerned about this and I, I want to go get checked out. <laughs> and so I called and made an appointment with my doctor and um, fully expecting him to say, everything's normal. It's all fine. And to calm my fears and tell me everything looked good and maybe even see my baby, you know, that kind of thing. So I went in and I told him, I'm having a little bit of spotting, but I know that can be normal and I haven't had any other symptoms and whatever. And the doctor was like, well, I'm sure everything will be great, but let's just go ahead and take a look anyway. So did an ultrasound and I should have been seven and a half weeks pregnant and the baby only measured five weeks and there was no heartbeat. Um, and she looked at me and she was like, your baby is measuring really small. Do you know what that means? And all these thoughts came flooding into my brain and I really couldn't voice any of them. And I just kind of nodded at her. I was trying not to cry. Um, and she said, I, I just said, what are the chances that we're wrong? What are the chances that maybe my baby is alive and just behind? And she said, at this point, because you know your date so well, which I did, she said, it's really only like a maybe a one in 20 chance. And I, and I clung to that one in 20. I was like, maybe, maybe there's a chance. Um, but I didn't cry at the doctor's office. <laughs> um, and because it was COVID time, my husband couldn't be there with me. So I didn't cry until I was in the car and I FaceTimed him and I just lost it. Like everything crumbled to pieces. And he answered the phone and he just took one look at my face and was like, all right, don't say anything, just drive home. And when you get home, we'll talk about it. So I drove home walked in the door and my husband was waiting for me at the door and we cried together. We didn't talk. <laughs> we cried and we cried. And then, um, when we had no tears left, he said, okay, what are our chances? And I said, one in 20. And he said, well, that's okay. That's a little bit of hope, but what are we going to do about it? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> and, um, he said, well, remember, we've talked about this, that if, if God was going to ask us to go through something hard, then we were going to choose to trust him. And so my husband prayed and I don't remember what he said in that prayer. Um, I just remember thinking, Lord, I don't know how we're going to do this. And I need you to help us to trust you. And I, I need you to, to help me to trust you and help me to choose that because um, I don't know what we're going to do. And so after we prayed, my husband said, I think we need to tell our parents. And I was like, do we have to? <laughs> we hadn't even told them that we were pregnant yet. We were waiting for Christmas, which was, you know, three days away um, to tell them that we were even pregnant. Um, his family was going to be getting there the, the very next day to spend Christmas with us. 
Um, and he said, I think we need to tell them. So we called our parents and we said, hey, your grandparents, but you're probably going to have to wait until heaven to meet your grandbaby and explain to them what was going on and that we really didn't have a whole lot of answers yet, but ask them to pray with us um, and ask them to pray for our faith because it was weak. <laughs> um, and my mother-in-law said, Sarah, don't worry about grocery shopping. Don't worry about cooking. We'll do it all when we get there. You just need to take care of yourself and um, get some rest and whatever you need to do. So my in-laws got there the very next day and my mother-in-law and my sister's-in-law, they did take care of me. <laughs> they did all the cooking that week. They cleaned my house for me and um, I was still pregnant and still had all the symptoms of being pregnant, but knew that our baby probably was not alive. Um, they even, my in-laws are from Wisconsin and they even brought like real Wisconsin brats and I couldn't eat them because they made me nauseous. And <laughs> I just remember thinking how unfair it was that I couldn't eat something because of being pregnant when I probably wasn't ever going to get to meet this baby. Um, so anyway, we went back on New Year's Eve to, for a follow-up appointment and they said, yeah, there's no change. Um, and there's this baby has died and this baby is gone. And so the doctor took us into his office and he said, do you know what you want to do? Um, if you want, do you know what your options are and do, which option do you want to take? And I had been doing a ton of research that whole week. I'm a very, um, sciencey minded research person. <laughs> and so I'd done a lot of research. I knew what the options were. And I knew that if at all possible, we wanted to miscarry naturally um, because I wanted that closure of giving birth to our baby, even if our baby was really tiny. Um, and our doctor was on board with that and said, let's, let's give it two more weeks. And um, if you still haven't delivered the baby, then we'll have to look into other options because he was afraid of um, infection and that kind of thing. So um, we went home and waited <laughs> and it was a lot of waiting. Um, at the beginning of the first full week of January, I went back to teaching. Um, I was a fifth and sixth grade teacher, but I told my principal, hey, this is going on. I might miscarry any minute. I don't know. <laughs> and, um, but just needed somebody to know what was going on. Um, and so that was Monday and Tuesday night, I went into labor and being a doula, I knew what labor was. And this sounds kind of weird, but I was really excited. It's like, my body is doing what it's supposed to do now. And I know that these are contractions and I'm a weirdo. So I checked my own cervix and I knew that it was dilated and effaced and all of those things. And I knew what was going on and I knew that this was a labor and this was a birth and I was once once it started, once labor started, then I felt like I was prepared and I, I knew what to do from that point. It was all the waiting up to that point that was really hard. <laughs> um, until everything I thought was normal until I passed out in the bathroom. Um, and I had just lost so much blood, um, too much, and it was at a dangerous level. Um, and so... I passed out and my husband had to take me to the emergency room and that's a whole fiasco. That's a whole nother story, <laughs> but because of COVID, he couldn't go in with me and I had to be in the emergency room alone. Um, but that's where my baby was born. And I remember, I remember thinking I should be really scared right now, but I'm not because I know that God is in control of this and I know that he'll take care of me. Um, and I had a playlist on my phone of songs that had been a comfort to me over the past three weeks up to that point. <laughs> and I just played that playlist on repeat in the emergency room um, because I didn't know, I, I didn't even have the words to pray. <laughs> um, and those songs were kind of the prayer of my heart. Um, they had the words that I didn't have. <laughs> um, and so after a night in the ER and all kinds of traumatic things <laughs> that I won't go into detail about. Um, my One of my parents' best friends um, 
is an ER nurse and she happened to be working the morning shift that day. And so when she got to the hospital for her shift, she saw our car and saw my husband sitting out in our car and he went, she went over and prayed with him and talked with him and figured out what was going on. Um, and then she came in and as soon as she clocked in, she came to my room and found me and she had lost a baby before my best friend. Um, and so she knew what I was going through and she knew how to pray for me and pray with me. And she knew, she knew not to use all the platitudes and cliches <laughs> and she knew how to be gentle with me. Um, and from that point on, that was the pattern with all the people in our church that they were so very gentle with us and careful with our hearts. Um, and they grieved with us and they mourned with us. And I think, I think I have our church to thank for the healing in my heart. <laughs> um, it, we had such a wonderful support system through losing peanut. Um, and I don't know, I think I would be a lot more bitter if we hadn't had that support system. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> oh, it does, yeah. So as soon as I got the all clear from the doctor to start trying again, we started trying again. But it became pretty clear that we were going to really struggle um, with getting pregnant again. And it was um, almost, almost a year and a half before we got pregnant again. And I know that doesn't, in the infertility world, a year and a half isn't a really long time, but it was forever long for us. Um, and so when we saw, when I saw that positive pregnancy test again, a year and a half later, after a year and a half of praying and begging God for another baby, I was so scared and absolutely terrified. And I knew what the possibilities were. I knew that there was a possibility that the same thing would happen all over again. But my husband reminded me that God gives good gifts and he delights in giving good gifts to us. And that sometimes those good gifts come in the form of suffering. <laughs> um, and But it's a gift that draws us closer to him. And then sometimes the gifts come in the form of blessing. And sometimes a blessing is what God uses to bring us closer to him too. Um, and so it was another, another point of choosing to trust God no matter what happened with the second baby. And um, it was nine months of a pregnancy of choosing to trust God no matter what happened. And at every stage it was like, okay, here's another milestone that we've reached and thank you Lord for the blessing of this milestone and help us to trust you whether you're going to bring suffering or blessing with the next thing and then in February um Josiah was born and we named him Josiah because the name means the God who heals and um he was a big part of God healing us <laughs> Um, and there was a lot of healing that happened before Josiah and there's still healing that's coming after Josiah, but, um, we felt that his name, um, paid the correct level of, of honor to the God who has healed us. So that's our story in a nutshell. There you go. <laughs> I love the name you chose for him. I didn't know that that's what it meant. I think that's the perfect name. Yeah. I, we were going back and forth between, da um, his name is Daniel Josiah and he has his grandfather's initials. So we were going back and forth between Daniel Joseph and Daniel Josiah. And I was like, mm -hmm. I'm just going to look up the meanings of these names. And when I saw that Josiah means the God who heals, I was like, this is it. This has to be his name. We can't do anything else. <laughs> so. I love that though. And it sounds like you had a really great support system throughout the whole thing, did. which is, you know, a lot of people don't have that. Yeah. And it's nice that, you know, they didn't try to make the, the those comments we all hate hearing and, you know, we, we definitely all heard comments, but we really, there's been a lot of um, suffering and loss in our church. And so there's something about when you've gone through loss that you know how to, how to interact with other people who have gone through loss, even if it's not quite the same kind of loss. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, no, it does. Yeah. 
but yeah, so our church was learning at that time. Um, we had in about a year, um, we had four miscarriages. Our pastor was diagnosed with cancer and our secretary was diagnosed with cancer. Um, our pastor lost his dad and his sister. Um, I mean, we, uh, oh, and our senior pastor resigned. So our assistant pastor was the one that had the cancer and lost his dad and his sister. Um, and we just had a lot of, of grieving and suffering. And so our church was learning how to grieve collectively. And um, it was a really big learning time for all of us together to learn how to support each other through grief and sorrow. Um, and that it's, it's okay to lament. Um, and there's a lot of lamenting in the Bible. <laughs> um, and so our church learned how, is learning, <laughs> has learned how to lament together and how to worship God through grief and suffering. And so our loss happened right in the middle of that learning. <laughs> and it allowed our church to learn even more how to graciously handle that. I don't, so I'm thankful for that. <laughs> I know that you had your loss during, you know, the, the height of COVID. So was it, did that make it extra hard to not be able to have your husband there with you? Yeah, there were, I mean, the, when we got to the ER, the nurse was more concerned with making sure my husband didn't go back with us than she was about making sure that I was like alive. <laughs> so I mean, I was clearly and obviously bleeding out. There was a puddle of, of blood on the chair that I sat on and she called security on my husband to make sure that he would leave before she made sure that I got in to be seen. So it just complicated matters. Um, and yeah, but that's, then, yeah, that's ridiculous. Yeah. Then in the ER, I didn't have an advocate and they did a, a a D and E without telling me what they were doing. Um, and they just told me like they, they gave me the misoprostol to, to dilate, um, my cervix and told me that it was just pain medication. And then when they stuck, I mean, they use a tube for the evacuation part of a D and E and they told me it was just to clean out blood so that they could see what was going on in there. And so they just flat out lied about everything. Yeah. yeah. So, but because nobody else was there to advocate for me or to know what was going on and I was kind of out of it, yeah. um, then there was nobody to, to call them out on it or to know what, what was going on, um, to advocate for me. So I'm so sorry that happened to you. That's, that's horrible. It, it took, I didn't realize that that was what, what happened until years later. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there's layers to trauma and that was another layer that had to be pulled back and and worked through, but yeah. So were you um, a doula at the, you said you were a doula at the time? Did yeah. you go right back to doing that or did you have to take a break from that or? Um, yeah, I went, I took a little bit of a break, but um, I think because of losing a baby, I realized how important it was to have support through loss. And so about six months after we lost our baby, um, I also certified as a bereavement doula. And so I support moms through loss and through living births um, and do kind of the whole gamut of it now. Um, but it was probably another year before I attended a living birth. Um, and it was a really sweet healing experience for me <laughs> just to know that God does allow healthy births and does allow living babies to be born too. So have you helped a lot of moms like through loss yet or? Um, I haven't been there in person for any moms mm -hmm. through loss, but I've done a lot of virtual support. Mm -hmm. Um, even like right in the middle of miscarriages, texting a mom and helping answer questions and explain what's going on and um kind of doing virtually I don't know <laughs> um, I think that's great that you're able to do that though I feel like you know when, when people go through miscarriage 
so many doctors don't tell you what to expect, what, yeah. you know, they're just like, well, you might bleed and then, you know, come back if there's a problem and yeah. Like, okay, which, there's so much more. <laughs> yeah. Which was why it was a little bit surprising to me when like, because I am a doula, I explain to moms all the time what labor is going to be somewhat like, and obviously labor is different for every mom, but when I was miscarrying and felt contractions I was like wait this is labor they told me it would be like a period this is not like a period <laughs> this is definitely labor and that's what's going on but... yeah I, I never knew that um I had two early losses and and mine were we they were so early there was never a heartbeat or anything so it was just like that for me no contractions or anything but until I started really getting in with the loss community and learning wow like you know, there are contractions, you can birth your baby. Yeah, you do. I mean, even those, your really early losses, um, there were still contractions probably, but just so, um, whatever the opposite of strong is, <laughs> that, that you probably just didn't feel them or recognize them as that. So, I had but no idea. But still has to contract in order to deliver a baby, no matter how big the baby is. So. so it's likely that probably just felt more like the cramping. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I never knew that. Yeah. You so many something. things <laughs> that we never told. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I don't think, I don't blame that on doctors. I think they're not taught what it is. And so if they haven't ever experienced it or been taught what it's like, then they don't know. So they just go based off of what the rhetoric is. So. Yeah, I agree. It's probably, you know, one of those um, one or two paragraphs in a textbook, like here's what yeah. you do for a miscarriage. And that's all. Yep. Yeah. I, we were, our doctor, he did say it would be like a heavy period, but he also, he was a lot more gracious than a lot of doctors that I've heard of. And I think it's because his wife had had a miscarriage. And so he had the personal experience of it and he was very careful with us. And made sure that we were heard, um, which I appreciate. It was the ER doctor that was not great. <laughs> I haven't heard a lot of, I mean, there, I'm sure there are good ER doctors out there, but I, I've heard a lot of not great stories about ER experiences. So, uh, so, oh, go ahead. I said, oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I know you said that the church helped you a lot with your grief. Is there anything else that helped you get through your grief? Um, I think starting, I, I started the pregnancy after loss doula, um, Instagram page. And I think starting that page and then talking about my experiences and what I was like, what I had gone through and what I was going through with, with struggling to get pregnant and all of that was really healing for me. Um, I process things by talking <laughs> and so being able to, well, or honestly, even more writing than talking. And so being able to write down what was going through my mind and sharing it with people and having them say, oh, me too. This is this is what's going on for me too. That was a big, it's just healing to be able to, to recognize that you're not alone in something. Um, and a lot of times I would write a post and think there is nobody else who's ever experienced this. I have to be the only one. <laughs> and then I would get dozens of people who would be like, oh, me too. I thought I was the only one. And <laughs> that, I, I mean, recognizing and realizing that we're not alone. There's nothing new under the sun, <laughs> um, even in, in grieving and loss that, um, yes, we're all different, but we're also all similar. And you're not alone in going through loss and grief and all of that. So. Do you have any advice for someone who's newly going through a loss? Um, find a support system, <laughs> even if it has to be an Instagram community. <laughs> um, but don't, I know a lot of times people are afraid to talk about it. Um, and it is really scary to talk about it. <laughs> don't get me wrong. But if you choose to tell someone, chances are they will either have gone through it themselves or they'll know someone who has. And um, 
I was amazed. I posted on my Facebook while we were in that waiting period and just said, hey, friends, we just found out that we're losing our baby and we would really appreciate prayers. And probably a dozen women messaged me and said, hey, I've lost a baby. And if you need someone to talk to, I'm right here. And um, our babies are together in heaven. And if you need someone to a shoulder to cry on, I'll come over. <laughs> And a few people were like, I'm bringing you a meal. You can't say no. And um, that kind of thing too. But um, in order to get support, you have to be a little bit vulnerable. And I know that that's really scary. Um, but at least in my experience, it's worth being a little bit vulnerable to get that support and the love that people will step up and show you. I think, I know you mentioned the, you know, the Instagram community, and I actually found it to be so helpful, even more so than some of the people, like physical people in yeah. my life, just because like you said, they know exactly how you feel. They, yeah. they don't make you feel crazy for the ways that you feel. <laughs> yeah. Even if you have to make a secret Instagram account, just so that you can be part of it. I, I have, <laughs> I've had people who like message me and they're like, this is a secret Instagram account. That none of my family and friends know about, but I needed to find support and I didn't want them to know that I've lost a baby. So I created this secret Instagram account in order to look for other moms like me and I found you. And um, I think it's pretty neat when people find me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but also like there is there are a lot of us in the lost mom Instagram world and all of us are willing to talk to any new lost mom and um sometimes it, it's just helpful to have somebody who's willing to listen. So. And that's the cool thing about it too. I mean, you can talk to people from all around the world, you know, yeah. that you wouldn't be, normally be able to talk to or people who live in countries where, you know, they're not really allowed to talk about it or, yeah. you know, things like that. Yeah. And I know that there are communities and in countries and, and places where it's not safe to talk about something like this. Um, and that's why the internet is so great. Like there are faults with the internet. Don't get me wrong, <laughs> but, but the connection that we can have because of it is really neat. So it is. So did you find that your husband also got support after your last? He did. Yeah. It, I think it's, it's harder for a man to get on Instagram and look for other lost dads. <laughs> that's just <laughs> not how men do things, but, um, and my husband, he grieves by doing. I grieve by talking. He grieves by doing. And there were a couple of men who invited him out to play disc golf or to go play basketball or that kind of thing. And we're just like, hey, I'm here if you want to talk, but I'll also just do with you and help you get get the energy out and, and action. <laughs> and um and that was really helpful for him. And um it took him a little bit longer to seek someone to talk to. Um, but when he did, there were several men in our church and, and his dad and my dad, both, um, who were like, we'll grieve with you. And uh, men grieving together is a lot different than women grieving together. They don't cry, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but they also were comfortable with letting him cry. And he did cry with some of these men. Um, and they were comfortable with letting him cry and they allowed him to do that. And they, they didn't make him feel weak or not masculine or whatever for crying. They understood that losing a baby is hard, um, no matter when that baby dies. And they walked with him really carefully through that and gave him the space to be able to, to talk if he wanted to, or to not talk if he didn't want to, <laughs> um, without judgment so that's great that he had those people so many men are just kind of well yeah. you got to get through it on your own I, you know you can't cry you can't grieve you have to be strong and right you know they lost a baby too yeah and I, it took us a while to talk to each other about it um because I think both of us were afraid to to bring it up with the other <laughs> um but once we did, it was, oh, both of us are grieving really deeply. And um, 
we're both really sad about this. <laughs> and even um, hours after Josiah was born, um, my husband just suddenly burst into tears and he was sitting there holding our brand new baby and crying. And he said, now I understand what I missed out on with Peanut. And I'm so sad that we didn't get this with, with Peanut. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Oh, it's okay. Um, but even two and a half years later, when we have a living baby in our arms, he's still grieving our baby in heaven, and I'm still grieving our baby in heaven, and that's okay. <laughs> um, and it's taken us a while to recognize that that joy doesn't cancel out grief. Um, sometimes even joy makes grief more intense. Um, but that's okay. <sighs> And it's a normal part of life and it's okay to grieve and have joy at the same time. So I think so many people don't realize, you know, if they've never been through loss or even, you know, some that have think that, okay, if I just have that living baby, then everything's going to be better. And unfortunately, even though sometimes we wish it was that way, it, yeah. it's, it's not, <laughs> you know, we spend the rest of our lives missing the baby that we should have. Yeah. So is there anything else that you'd like to share or add? Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, my Instagram handle is pregnancy after loss doula. And so if there is somebody who just doesn't know who to talk to, like my DMs are always, always, always open. And um, my husband is not active on Instagram, but I pass things on to him pretty often. And he... He's really good about, well, this is probably what her husband is thinking and why he's being stupid. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so I can pass that on to that mom. And um, honestly, he should do, he should do couples therapy with me, like as the therapist, but he doesn't want to. <laughs> <do that>, so. <laughs> That's funny though. <laughs> He'll be good at it. <laughs> So I did have one other question for you. Are yeah. you, um, do you plan to tell your son about peanut? Yeah. I mean, we, he's only three months old, so he doesn't understand anything yet, but we have told him <laughs> about that. Um, yeah. My mom went for our, our baby shower with Josiah. He, she made these little cross stitch, um, embroidery plaque things mm -hmm. And one has Josiah's name and his birthday on it. And the other one has Peanut's name and his birthday on it. And we're planning on having that. We just moved. So we haven't put them up in our house yet. But um, I, I think it's important for Peanut to, or for Josiah to recognize that Peanut is a part of our lives too. And um, how much God taught mommy and daddy through Peanut and through our pregnancy with, with Josiah, um, it would be doing a disservice to God if we didn't talk about, continue to talk about peanut. So. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on today and sharing your story with us. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I'm glad it worked out. Thank you so much, Sarah, for sharing your story with us. I think it's absolutely normal to question or not be as strong in your faith after a loss. We have a lot of anger and resentment, and sadness, and sometimes this is the easiest place to direct the feelings. So I just want to remind you that it's okay to be angry with God. My mom once told me that it's okay to be angry with God because he can take it, and he knows what is truly in our hearts. And that has always stuck with me. Again, it is okay to be angry. And it's also okay if your loss brings you closer to God and makes you stronger in your faith. We all have different reactions to loss. It's all normal. It's all okay. I never liked when people say God had a plan or God must have needed an angel. I've never found these to be helpful comments. I don't think God planned for any of us to lose our babies. These are just things that happen and they can and do happen to anyone, regardless of age, race, nationality, or income level. They happen to bad people and they happen to good people. And it just doesn't make us feel better thinking that there was some grand reason or grand plan to what happened to us. Because ultimately, 
it doesn't bring our baby back. And that is the thing that we really want. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Please leave a review or rating if you like the show. Thank you so much for tuning in and remember, we are all in this together.